Following the Alexander Treaty between the Hittite Empire and the city of Ilion, most of the western Anatolia fell under the Hittite control. Their long-time rivals for the supremacy in this region, the Achaeans, started with the military preparations in order to regain influence over this historically contested area. One of the first actions of the Greeks was support for the anti-Hittite renegades of the former Arzawan territory. Chief among those warlords was an Anatolian leader who would grow into the greatest enemy of the Hatti, waging wars against as many as four kings of the Hittites over the time span of 40 plus years. This warlord was in the Hittite records, known as Piyama Radu. Wanax TV is a channel that walks you through the history of the Achaeans, from the early Greek Bronze Age settlements through their expansion, conflicts with the Minoan Crete, the Hittite Empire, the legendary Trojan War, and the great events of the Heroic Age, all the way through to the classical Greece, the Achaean League and the wars against the Roman Republic. Please consider subscribing and sharing the video, as this is a one-person production and it greatly helps the visibility of the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. Born in the late 14th century BCE, Piyamaradu's lineage is still debated among the scholars. Many consider him to be a descendant and a grandson of Uhaziti, the last independent Arzawan king who was conquered by the Hittites. Uhaziti's son, Piyama Korunta, is believed by some to have been Piyamaradu's father, although this is still up for the speculation. Either way, Piamaradu seems to have been a noble with regnal claims in western Anatolia, more specifically of the former Arzawan territories, now controlled by the Hittites. During the early 13th century BCE, the Achaeans started taking more of a confrontational stance towards the Hittites, which was warmly regarded by the pro-Arzawan rebels throughout the region. It is unknown whether Piyamaradu was originally born in Arzawa or the Achaean-controlled possessions, but he certainly had connections with the Achaeans since the young age, especially with the city of Miletus, which served as a safe haven for many Arzawan exiles. As the anti-Hittite sentiment in the region increased, the time was perfect for young Piyamaradu to rise up in arms and make a name for himself. The renegade army was assembled and soon enough, the attack was launched against the lightly protected territories in Arzawa. As many of those cities were ruled over by Hittite dignitaries with limited manpower at their disposal, Piyamaradu was able to achieve critical success and the city of Ialanda was taken by the Anatolian warlord. As Muvatali II, the king of the Hittites, was busy dealing with problems to the east, his vassal ruler of the Seha riverland, Manapatar Hunta was ordered to deal with Piyamaradu. Little did Tarhunta know, Piyamaradu was receiving heavy support from the Achaeans, particularly from the city of Miletus, whose ruler Atpas married Piyamaradu's daughter. Somewhere around 1290 BCE, the battle between the Seha Riverland and the forces of Piyamaradu was fought on the border territory of Yalanda, and Piyamaradu once again proved to be a capable military commander. Manapatar Hunta was soundly defeated and his army destroyed. Following the battle, 
Piamaradu marched to the Seha Riverland virtually unopposed, where Manapa Tarhunta had no choice but to accept the terms of the victorious warlord. Seha Riverland was now subjugated and brought under the control of Miletus, and Manapa Tarhunta was made a subject of Atpas. Piamaradu proceeded to conquer the island of Lesbos, which was likewise placed under the official jurisdiction of Atpas and de facto control of Piamaradu. A number of palace officials and also civilian captives were transferred to the city of Miletus. Next up was Troy, the great city of Ilion. A dynastic struggle had both Achaeans and Hittites involved, with Piamaradu's forces naturally supported his enablers, and soon enough the city of Ilion found itself controlled by the pro achaean forces. It was time for Mawatali II to finally react. The Hittite expeditionary force was dispatched from the new Hittite capital in Tarhuntasa to Ilion under General Kasu, who made a stop in Seha Riverland to request military aid. Manapa Tarhunta, now placed under the Achaean hegemony by Piamaradu, appeared to be sick and with his forces recently decimated, unable to provide any assistance. Nevertheless, Kasu managed to achieve success in Troy, either by diplomacy or military means, and Alexander was installed on the throne of Ilion with a treaty confirming his status as a Hittite vassal. Subsequently, Atpas also agreed to return the palace personnel from Miletus, and Hittites and Achaeans were back on being on the supposedly good terms, while at the same time Piamaradu managed to avoid the wrath of the Hatti. Furthermore, Manapatar Hunta was now deposed by the Hittites, with his son installed on the throne of Seha Riverland by the Hittite king. When Muvatali II died in 1272 BCE, he was succeeded by Morsili III, who moved the royal capital back to Hattusa and engaged in a period of internal instability on the court of Hatti. Piamaradu used this opportunity and expanded his realm in the following years, becoming de facto the most powerful warlord in all of western Anatolia. In 1267 BCE, Mursili was deposed from the Hittite throne by his uncle, Hattusili III. The new king ought to restore the peace within the empire and appointed Mursili's brother Kurunta as the king of the southern territories centered in Tarhuntasa. Hattusili wished to waste no time and attempted to quickly and permanently eliminate all threats coming from the west. The imperial army was assembled and marched not against the rebel Piamaradu, but directly against the Achaean possessions on the Anatolian coast. However, the newly crowned king was met and defeated by the Mycenaean army, which only triggered a wider conflict between the two powers. In about 1265 BCE, the Achaean expeditionary force sacked the city of Troy, killing its ruler, a successor of Alexander. Subsequently, the Hittite army marched against the Mycenaeans once again and a war over Ilion ensured significant casualties on both sides. Ultimately, Hattusili managed to persuade his Achaean counterpart to give up on Ilion, likely with a significant compensation. The Achaean Hittite peace was agreed and the two powers became nominal allies. However, the peace proved to be nothing more than a piece of paper as Piamaradu was still heavily supported by the Achaeans and the Anatolian warlord decided to invade even further into the Hittite-controlled territory. 
The border city of Atarima was invaded by the forces of Piamaradu and burnt down together with the Hittite royal compound. As the nearby region of Lucia consisted of a number of independent cities, the rulers applied to both Hatti and Achaea in order to resolve the situation and avoid further war. The king of Achaea sent his own brother as his representative, a man known in the Hittite texts as Tawagalawa, likely named Tagalawas or possibly Etiocles, according to the modern scholars. Tagalawas was a person of high authority both inside the Mycenaean Greece and internationally, and upon landing in Miletus, ordered Piamaradu himself to go to Lucia and negotiate with the Hittites. The Hittites were represented by Hattusili III, the great king himself, who stationed himself in the nearby city of Salapa and the terms of head-to-head -head meeting were being discussed. Piamaradu sent an envoy to Hattusili III requesting that the Hittite crown prince, Hattusili's son Tudhalia, comes to Piamaradu first before Piamaradu comes to Hattusili himself. As Tudhalia arrived, the Hittite request was to bring Piamaradu to the Hatti king on chariot and further discuss the terms inside the Hittite camp. Piamaradu refused, probably out of fear from being captured and likely killed by the Hittites, and instead requested to be recognized as a king on the spot, nominally subordinate to the Hittites before entering any further negotiations. Hattusili knew that this would essentially mean surrender of the territory as Piamaradu had deep connections with the Achaeans and it would be almost impossible for the Hittites to exercise any real power over him. Subsequently, the negotiations broke down and Piamaradu returned to Yalanda with both sides preparing for the inevitable. This time, Piamaradu was marked as the biggest threat to the stability of the Hittite Empire and the great king of Hatti himself was personally in charge of the imperial army, heading for the crucial showdown. Piamaradu returned with his followers to Yalanda, an Anatolian city that served as a base of his operations. Hattusili III led the Hittite army in person and decided to make a stop at the city of Waliwanda and attempted to resolve the situations peacefully for the last time. The city of Yalanda used to be one of the main Arzawan centers before the Hittite conquest of the land and remained fiercely opposed to the Hatti and their dignitaries ever since. However, for Hattusili, it was necessary to bring it back under the Hittite control in order to re-establish stability on the western borders of the empire. The Hittite king sent a note to Piamaradu informing the warlord that he was approaching the city with his army. If Piamaradu wished to obtain territory and eventually be recognized by the Hittites, he was to abandon the city and leave the nominal Hittite territory together with all of his soldiers and followers. The warlord refused and prepared his men for battle. As Hattusili approached the nearby territory, the two armies engaged. It is unknown whether or not Piamaradu personally led his army, but the battle was difficult for both sides, with an indecisive outcome. According to the Hittite sources, the terrain was rough and remote, and another battle soon followed under the similar circumstances. As the Hittites appeared to gain an upper hand, the great king Hattusili fell into an ambush of a new army contingent led by Piamaradu's brother Lahurzi. 
Hatushili was now forced to dismount and fight on foot in what was another hard-fought battle that brought heavy losses to both sides and had no clear winner. It is unknown what was Lahurzi's role in the whole conflict, but the Hittite king clearly didn't expect him to be involved as he later complained to the king of Achaea about these Lahurzi's actions. Either way, Lahurzi's army, together with his brother Piamaradu, put up another third battle against the Hittites, but this time Hattushili managed to prevail and the rebel forces were finally forced to withdraw from the Yalanda territory. Hattushili therefore entered the city and ordered it to be destroyed as a punishment. The Hittite king decided not to further pursue Piamaradu, considering his heavy losses and not wanting to take any further risk. After setting up a small garrison in a fortress called Atria to watch over the area, Hattushili approached the territory of Miletus and sent his messengers to Piamaradu, calling for a meeting outside of the Achaean territory. Piamaradu, now obviously enjoying support from his son-in-law and Miletus's ruler, Atpas, once again refused to meet the Hittite king. Hattushili, not wishing any direct confrontation with Miletus, an Achaean palace center, decided to send his complaints directly to the Achaean king on the Greek mainland. Soon after, the Achaean messengers were dispatched to meet the Hittite king, informing him that another message was sent to Atpas, ordering him to turn Piamaradu to the Hittites. As Hattuchili entered Miletus, he found no Piamaradu, only to learn that the warlord had just escaped by ship to one of the Aegean islands. By now, it was obvious that Piamaradu wouldn't have been able to do any of that if he wasn't receiving the Achaean support, at least coming from the rulers of Miletus. The Hittite king therefore met with Atpas and his brother, Awayanas listing charges against Piamaradu. The Achaean nobles, however, denied any involvement and promised Hattushili that they would report everything back to their king. Hattushili demanded hostages from Atpas in order to make sure that he keeps his promise, but this request was turned down and Hattushili reluctantly left the city and went back to the Hittite territory. The communication between Piamaradu and Hattushili would soon resume, as the outlaw warlord kept requesting the territory in Arzawa under threats of resuming military activities against the Hatti, if not from Miletus, then from the lands of Caria and Mycia, while his family and followers stood safe on the Aegean islands. It was at this time that Hattushili III composed the famous letter to the Achaean king, listing the accusations against Piamaradu and going through the recent events in great detail. The letter was incorrectly labeled the Tawagalawa letter by the scholars as the Achaean king's name was not mentioned, although it was him and not his brother Tawagalawas, the precise person Hattushili was complaining to. Hattushili repeatedly called his Achaean counterpart his brother, his peer and a great king, even confessing his past mistakes of being hostile to the Achaeans. This was probably done in desire to get the Achaean ruler to cooperate, but also reflected the position that the Achaeans held from the Hittite point of view, which listed the king of Achaea as one of the great kings equal to the king of Hatti, together with the kings of Egypt, Babylon and Assyria. Hattushili, therefore, suggested three options to his Achaean peer. One was to pursue Piamaradu to surrender to the Hittites and then eventually negotiate with them on his own. The second option was to stay in the Achaean territory but avoid engaging in any of the activities against the Hittites. 
and the third option in case he wanted to continue the attacks on the Hittite territory was to force Piamaradu to move from the Achaean territory to another country such as Mycia or Caria and engage in his activities from there and without the Achaean support. The exact Achaean response and their actions following this letter are not known, but it's apparent that Piamaradu continued with his attacks on the Hittite lands. This was evident by the prayer of Puduhapa, the Hittite queen and Hattushili's wife, who went to the coastal Hittite sanctuary and made offerings and prayer against Piamaradu. Either way, Piamaradu was at advanced age by this time and his activities posed nowhere near the threat he represented in his heyday. Hattushili III would pass away at around 1237 BCE, succeeded by his son Tudhalia IV, who soon started referring to Piamaradu in the past sense suggesting that the old warlord passed away as well around this time. The region of western Anatolia would continue to be an area of perennial conflict, with both Achaeans and Hittites still involved, but the disruption caused by Piamaradu would leave deep scars in this region, an everlasting legacy of the Anatolian lord of war. Please consider subscribing and sharing the video as this is a one person production and it greatly helps the visibility of the channel. Special thanks to History with Sai, Nico, Panayotis Yanopoulos, Fred Lecky and Estate Care for their continuous support. If you wish to become a Patreon member, please click the link in the video description. This was 1XTV and we'll see you again soon.